Hello, and welcome to our Full Sail University Hall of Fame presentation. Just to make sure everyone is in the right place, this is our sports casting round table. Awesome, awesome. All right, so let's go ahead and get things started. All right, thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Gordy Hershiser. Welcome to Hall of Fame Week 2010 here at Full Sail University. Welcome, everybody, here on the floor. As you can see, we have a very distinguished panel. And so over the next 80 minutes, uh, we're going to get you insight into what it is all about being a sportscaster and then some. Kendall's going to be working the floor, so if you have a question, just raise your hand. She'll take you, uh, she'll bring the microphone over to you. But before I continue to speak any further, I do have a partner in crime. You know him, you love him. He's on my far left. Put your hands together for Rishi Barron. Thank you, everyone. Well, the, the real stars of the show here are in the middle, and we have assembled a great panel. They all have different stories and different backgrounds, but all very successful in their field. Let's start with the man to my right, Zach Farley. It all started at Westfield State University as a Madden player and turned into something much bigger, ended up designing the official Madden strategy guide where he would put meticulous work into Madden to figure out the best plays to work for you. And since then, he's gone on to host his own shows. Um, started as This Week in Madden, and now is called Madden Daily Drops. You can check that out. He also works for EA Sports and is a shoutcaster, among other things, and now the lead content, social content, and influencer for EA Sports. Everybody give it up for Zach Farley. In the middle, the great Jamie Say started her career in New York State, worked at a number of stations there in Watertown, New York, pretty cold up there, uh, then Syracuse, and then her hometown of Albany, where she was the sports director. And now she's been in Orlando for about eight years, works at New Six as the sports director there. And also this year, the voice of the Orlando Apollos. Give it up for Jamie Say. <laughs> And to her right, Charles Davis, four-year starter on the football field at the University of Tennessee and his NFL dreams, got a little cup of coffee there in training camp and then cut short by the great Tom Landry, but since then a lot of success, has worked everywhere from Stanford University to uh, the wor wide world of sports complex where among other things became the first African-American tournament director for a PGA Tour event, the Disney Classic, and uh, plenty of other stops along the way. But now, great things that he's doing. He is part of the number two broadcast team on the NFL on Fox, also works for NFL Network, and also a commentator for Madden. Here is Charles Davis. So all of you have a different story, a different road here, but there is one thing that has united all of you in one way, and it's a passion for what you do. And why don't we just go down the line here, starting with Zach. Zach, how were you able to turn passion into a job that you actually get paid for? Yeah, it's pretty interesting. Back in 2008, we started traveling up and down the East Coast to go to Madden tournaments, me and a buddy. We packed five dudes in a Corolla, and we ventured on down to Philadelphia. I, of course, lost in the first round and <laughs> then had to drive all the way home. So I found out I wasn't that great at playing the game. I was very, very good, but not necessarily like a peak level performer at that moment. So what I learned about was the ability to kind of share information. If aliens attacked Earth and there was only one thing that I could do, I wouldn't necessarily be the best person at beating one alien one on one. But if they wanted to play a thousand games, I could be the best person to teach a thousand people how to get really good at the game fast to beat the aliens. So that's what the president would ask me to do if aliens attack the earth. <laughs> so once I kind of figured out that was like the thing I could do better than anybody else, it was like, how do I get that message out to more people? From there, we started to use like a flip camera, which was this really cool camera back in the day that they don't make anymore, unfortunately. Um, kind of like an iPhone, do you guys have those? Would have worked if we had had those, but um, recording that, getting that message out to people, starting with YouTube and in other ways to just connect and collaborate and then use my background, create stories and, and write all of that. So that's how I initially got started and it just was a grind to keep going and going and going and eventually you get up here somehow and you look back and 
all the dots seem connected at the moment, but they don't when you're kind of doing it. So just keep on trucking and, and get that passion going forward. But that's kind of how it got uh, began. Yeah, yeah, for me, I was uh, kind of a square peg in a round hole growing up. I was, I was a sports geek. Um, none of my girlfriends were. Uh, it all started when I first saw Hulk Hogan coming in the ring. I'm not going to lie. Nice. The WWF got nice. me interested in sports. It was that drama of competition. Whether it was real or if it was contrived, I just fell in love with two teams or two guys duking it out. Uh, and then that kind of went into basketball and football and baseball. And when I was 16, that's when I knew I wanted to be a sportscaster. I wanted to make sports my job because I had no other clue what I wanted to do. And you know that time in your life, when you're a sophomore, when you're a junior in high school, there's a lot of pressure on you to figure out what you want to do because college is such a big deal and what you're going to do after high school is such a big deal. And I was like, I want to be Marv Albert. I, I want to be Bob Costas. I want to be Linda Cohn. I want to be Robin Roberts. That's what I want to do. And back in my day when I, when I was younger, um, I, I, uh, I'm an 80s kid. Uh, there weren't very many female sportscasters. So I thought, hey, I, I want to I want to do something that not a lot of women are doing. And uh, I discovered that Syracuse University was a pretty good path at that time. And that's how it happened. It's been 20 years in the business for me. And I can honestly say I love going to work every single day. There's no other job I'd rather do. I've been able to cover some events that I never dreamed uh, that I've been able to do, that I would be able to do when I was that 16 year old. It's been a blessing and, and that's kind of how it is. And, and I try and project my passion and my enjoyment for sports um, on the air every night. It's been awesome. You guys have made a really good choice. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, and before I start with my little thing, Zach, first of all, we go back a ways without knowing it as we, as we discovered my dad was a ba assistant basketball coach at Marist College where Zach's father played, and Zach's father could fill it up, all right? So <laughs> trust me on this one. Ball needed to be in the basket, Zach's father got the ball. So I have just one quick question. When you lost in the first round and you had five of you in the Corolla, did you wait for them, or did you just take off with the Corolla and leave them behind? <laughs> I, I had the middle seat because I was the last guy in. It was tough. I lost So early. they didn't give you the keys? They shoved me back in the middle, and then we had to go. It's tough. Yeah, it's tough out there, no doubt. And Jamie, you're talking about the WWF with Hulk Hogan. Just to give away my age, the W. It used Why to be. Why are you looking at me? It used to be called the WWWF, <laughs> the World Wide Wrestling Federation, before they got in a little bit of trouble with a certain wildlife group, and had to change everything to WWE. But to hear your passion, Jamie, to hear you talking about it. I hope that one day I'll get a chance to inhabit a booth with you since you're calling games. Since you were, you know, because Gail Sirens would have been the woman calling games during my time that started to pave the way. So anyway, my passion really started young. Um, my dad was a high school teacher, high school coach, college coach, and I just kind of was raised in it. My dad played a college uh, football and baseball at a historically black college and university in West Virginia called Bluefield State University, which is now integrated. It integrated in the 70s. And he kind of let me go with that passion. And I got in trouble in the sixth grade because everything I was turning in on, in terms of an assignment, I found a way to turn it into a sports-related assignment. And my teacher, Mrs. Wicks, wasn't having any of that. So she called for a parent-teacher conference, and I got kicked out of the room after a very short amount of time. You have to remember, my dad taught in the same school system, from a place called New Paltz, New York. At the time, less than 3,000 people, so we all knew each other. The teachers all knew each other, whether it was middle school, high school, the whole deal. And my dad told Mrs. Wicks after she said, you know, this just isn't going to work. He said, well, why is it that that's a problem? She said, he said, let me ask you a question. If he turned in every paper, about the presidents of the United States, would you have a problem with that? If he turned in every paper about the history of the United States, would you have a problem with that? And went, and went through it kind of chapter and verse about different things that were accepted 
And he said, why can't he have the same passion about sports? There are professions out there. It's an integral part of our society. And it's not getting him in any trouble. So he had my back from the beginning and allowed me to, to, to flourish with that passion and played sports all the way through high school, college. As, as Rishi said, I had a small cup of coffee with the Dallas Cowboys, probably decaf. Decaf, <laughs> yeah. Probably decaf. And uh, they got rid of me pretty quickly when it was apparent that I couldn't keep up with the rest of those guys. And so I turned my passion into, into working and then lucky enough was able to stumble into this. I won't bore you with that story, but fortunate enough to start here in Orlando with Sunshine Network. And I remember, <laughs> remember those, those days, days yeah, sure. right? Sunshine Network, and then uh, steadily able to move my way along. And here I am today and get to work with Zach over at Madden. And it's pretty cool. And one day I'm going to share a booth with Jamie. So I'm looking forward to that. All great stories. I'm going to share a little story about myself. So when I was in the minor leagues, um, and you follow somebody by the name of Oral Hersheiser in 1988, you kind of draw a little <laughs> attention in the Texas League. So every single place that I went to, I was doing live shots. And much as Charles had the realization of, man, covering those wide receivers are pretty quick, you know, um, I have the theory of I got guys into the big leagues and Oral got them out. So <laughs> he, uh, he never gave me a severance package or anything like that or any kickback for, you know, helping out his career. But I realized that by doing... Uh, all these live shots um, and being on television and having the ability to uh, talk sports was really, really cool. And all of us, are, our journeys all weave through the same thing. And I find it interesting of how they set us up here. Because uh, before we started, I, I told Charles who, University of Tennessee, Orange, Jamie, Syracuse, Orange, we have a saying at the University of Alabama, Roll Tide, my alma mater, that nothing sucks like a big orange. <laughs> so, but Jamie, I was the sports director at Channel 6 here in Orlando. She is now there. Charles and I go back to the standpoint of when he was running the Disney golf tournament. I used to cover that event. That's when I first met him. And Zach, Z Farley, love that, kicking it. Yeah. Now, talk about a great story for Zach. He started his show. Does anyone see Wayne's World Saturday Night Live? <laughs> he is the epitome of Wayne's World. He and his partner started his show in his parents' basement. So if you want drive, you want determination, you want passion, you want to live that dream, see that dream, feel that dream, look at these three individuals right here. And that is the living proof of if you put your mind to it and don't accept no for an answer, you can make anything possible. And that's in your sights right now. So I want to know from you all, your keys to success. Because we've all been through hard times and stuff like that. I'm sure Jamie has great stories about ice fishing north of the border. <laughs> I'll kick it off with a couple things I see up here just in general. Uh, Rishi's preparation. I mean, people prepare. You have to prepare and over-prepare and get into a routine and just be an expert at your craft, whatever it is that you do. Like, he could have came up here and not researched us and just met us and winged it, but he didn't. I'm sure he took more notes than he had to, and I bet he's going to throw away 80% of those notes. I'm sure Charles, when he interviews the players, gets 20 stories he wants to tell on the broadcast and maybe gets to tell three when one of the players he interviews gets sick or gets hurt or the game doesn't go that way. And it's you think it's a bummer at first because you're like, man, I had all this stuff. But you just kind of arm yourself with that information for later, and you get methodical about your process. And that's something that I can tell right now. The other thing is it doesn't cost anything to be nice. Uh, Charles said a lot of nice things about me, so I got to say some nice things about him, <laughs> but they're true. Um, so on Sundays, I run all the social channels for Madden, and so I sit there and I watch the NFL games waiting for something to happen and then make a funny tweet. Um, and so as I do that, I hear Charles on the broadcast all the time, and then of course he's also in Madden as well. But I then go in on Monday mornings, 8 o'clock, who's there? Charles. Like Charles is always in the lunchroom or he's always getting into the recording studio on Monday at 8 a.m. Whether he was in Philadelphia the day before or Charlotte or wherever he is doing the Fox broadcast and he always has a smile on his face and he's always really really nice. Like he's larger than life to me because he's in the game and he's a commentator and that's something I've always wanted to aspire to be. But for him to just have a smile and say hello and talk about the human things and not necessarily, like I want to ask him about the game because he has insights that I want to learn about, but we end up talking more about family or my dad or just things that really bring a smile to your face on a Monday, figuring that he probably just got off an airplane at the Orlando airport, which is like mid-tier, 
you know, not great, not a lot of food <laughs> options. Um, <laughs> so he's, the, the he's, he's up late, overnight, working hard, and uh, he has a smile on his face no matter what. He's ready to get into the booth with his process, record new lines for the upcoming Madden, uh, and, and update all that. So he's just ready to go with a smile, super nice. And it's just a reminder, like, why can't we all be that way? Because so, some people are not that way. Most people are. But Charles really brings it to a next level. So just a big credit to him uh, about being nice. Yeah, I would echo a lot of the things that Zach just said. I mean, prepare well, uh, be nice, be respectful of people, be yourself. You know, be yourself. Um, allow your interview subjects to see who you are, to try and build that trust. Don't be funny, because, or don't be phony, I should say. Um, because that's really important when you're interviewing someone and they're trusting you to tell their story. You have to be yourself and, and be your authentic self. Um, another thing is work really, really hard and work really, really hard at a whole bunch of different things. Um, you know, I know how to edit. I know how to use the camera. I still do it today. I'm a sports director in a top 20 market. You know, maybe 20 years ago, 30 years ago, sports directors weren't doing that. But, you know, I get up like uh, tomorrow morning. I'll get up bright and early um, and go to Orlando City soccer practice by myself, one man banding interviews with the players. And then I will prepare to work until midnight tomorrow. Um, and that's part of the deal. That's been part of my deal. But I enjoy it because I want to get the story. So be prepared to work really hard. Sometimes you do have to sacrifice, but always, you know, prioritize and stuff like that. And the other um, key to success, I think, is don't allow yourself to plateau. Y you know, you're always a work in progress. No matter how good you think you are at that point, always try and get better because then you'll never get bored. Always challenge yourself and push yourself. Um, that's one thing that's kept me going, you know, after a couple of decades of doing this. Always try and reach another level and reach another level. What else can I do better? First of all, Zach, thank you very much for those kind words. And remember this, it works both ways. You know, you're awfully nice to me too. So, and I just gonna piggyback off of what Zach and Jamie both said all those things are very true and I'll just add one more thing. Well, actually two more things. Number one, command, your, command of your subject matter. I mean, that is just absolutely huge. It doesn't matter what you're going in there to do, what the job assignment is, you know, what, what, what people want to, you, you do, you to bring back. Know your subject matter, whether it's for a short interview, whether you're doing something for an entire season, learn about it, learn what, what makes it tick. And what I've always told people, and it's not always possible in a short amount of time, but if you're covering something over time, you should know the roots of it, you should know the origins, you should know the players all the way through, how it was created, who brought it to fruition, and who's carrying the torch now. You know, I'll go back very briefly when I got an assignment to work for Turner Sports and we were covering the Pac-12 and the Big 12 I called the Big 12 office and the Pac-12 office and asked for their resident historian, because just about every one of these groups has someone on staff, even if they're not named that. Oh yeah, talk to Margie or talk to Bobby. They, they know it all. And ask for information about the roots and origins of both conferences and who were the key players at each school and what coaches were famous and the whole deal. So I could have some context when I was doing a game if some record was broken, if some coach had established a new, new high water market, you know, if some player had done something. How did that relate at that school to something that had happened in the past? Because what that does for you is it ties things together for your audience. Because remember, your audience is going to be diverse, okay? And when we say diverse, I think everybody thinks of race. I'm talking about age, I'm talking about interests, I'm talking about these, some people were back there, well, you know, I remember when Norm Van Brocken was running a single wing, you know, and how does that tie into what we're doing now? Well, it darn near looks like the single wing in football now, with guys taking snaps back in shotgun as opposed to under center. And the last thing I'll tell you is organization. Be organized. It is one of the biggest things going, and I, I pride myself on trying to be an organized person. I just finished a book called The Education of a Coach by David Halberstam, and it's on Bill Belichick. And it was written after they won their third Super Bowl. So it was a little while ago, right? Anyway, in that book, 
it leapt off the page at me. I actually wrote it down. I'm going to laminate it and carry it with me. Bill Belichick said that he had learned after he had been in the league for a little while, what he thought the biggest key to success was, was being organized. So that you understood what you were trying to accomplish, what you needed to do to accomplish it, and how you needed to accomplish it in order to make yourself a better, and in his case, coach, I think it applies to all of us. So all the advice that they gave, those are just a couple extra things, a little land yap on top for you. So there. Charles, I appreciate you bringing up a book and an author that I reference in class all the time. So yeah. thank you for that. That's one of, so he's, one of, he's, one of the great, he's one of the great authors out there. I mean, if you have a chance in our profession and you read David Halberstam's collection, some of it will take, for, for most of you, you'll be like, God, what, what century was this written in? But trust me, read them. Some terrific breeds, reads in there. The Breaks of the Game that he wrote about the Portland Trailblazers in the 70s is one of the best books I've ever read in my life. I still reference it from time to time. But yeah, he's one of, he's one of my top authors. Jamie, what did you want to say? Yeah, I just, I just something else came to mind. Just a, another thing, I, I think it's important to show up. You know, go to the Magic practice, go to the Orlando City practice, go to UCF Knights practice. <laughs> Um, to get the story, to be around these coaches so they get to know you and, and know who you are, but also for potential future employers because I know when I go to UCF and I see their students who have the cameras and stuff like that, I know which ones work hard and which ones could be a potential fit for our station going forward. So it's really important to show up to things too. To factor that into like social media and all that and your profile and your portfolio of work that you have going forward like I can see a online resume in 10 seconds and tell you if they're a real person or like it's phony and that goes back to the showing up to the organization to the reliability if somebody can be accountable all those the process and like part of the process is showing up and doing it repeatedly until you get really good at it and screwing up so that you figure out where you fail and then getting a feedback loop so you can keep things going forward and as you guys prepare yourselves and you prepare your work and your, your clips and an online resume looks so much different than what it looked like before where you could send in a one sheet of paper. I saw a resume from somebody yesterday and it had Instagram story clips in the resume that showed they could do Instagram stories and cover stuff and grab a camera and had uh, broadcast experience and it, it was a cool way that I had seen a, a, I hadn't seen a resume before. And it was like, wow, this person's legitimate at what they do. They've put in, in the work and the time. And you can tell, I can, you can just quickly tell the better you get at it, like profiles that are made overnight or if, they're, if you're a real living person on the internet and you're behaving appropriately, that comes across so quick because it shows that you've done the process. It shows that you've been good at it over time. And it shows that you're reliable, consistent, and you're an instant, like, hey, I got to go find this guy. I look for those people, those, like those people, I don't need them to send me their stuff. Like, I go find those people. Hey, somebody referenced this guy's work. He's a Photoshop artist. I need graphics made for the Madden channel. I'm going to find this guy here. He's the best. People will then seek you out as you build up those profiles. So don't consider it like a one-way thing. We're not going to monster.com and dumping resumes across the thing. You can do that. But the, the way you're going to get this stuff in the future is the networking by the showing up, by consistency, by having that profile. And people will come to you. And it'll be a two-way kind of situation. Zach, you brought up social media. Let's explore a different side of it. And it's all of you are in the public eye, right? So there are people who will criticize. No. There is trolling. Never, never, right? Never. But how do you handle that when you face criticism, whether it be social media, emails, phone calls, whatever? Criticism? Criticism? <laughs> what? Really? Never. Uh, Jamie, why don't never. you handle yeah, okay. it? Okay. Okay. If they have a legitimate point, um, usually I don't engage uh, <laughs> with, with trolls on Twitter because it, it, if it's a waste of time, I, I just feel like I don't want to, you know, keep this going. I don't want to perpetuate this argument. It makes you feel bad. I mean, you, you get trolled on Twitter. It makes you feel bad. But you know what? In five minutes, you forget about it, too. So if I, if I kept it going, especially, you know, especially when it has to do with physical appearance or anything like that, because um, we all get that, um, you know, 
we get emails at the station a lot, and sometimes it is legitimate. I mean, sometimes you, you hear from your viewers and you get a good idea of what they want to see, what kind of content they want. So those are the ones I will respond to. Um, if they're appropriate, if they don't use foul language, if they're not attacking, because, you know, sometimes the language that they use, there's no convincing them. So it's just like, you know what? We're just going to press delete on that one. But if, it's, uh, if it makes sense and it makes you think, yeah, I'm going to respond, because I don't want to lose that viewer. You know, they're really important. And um, sometimes that's all they're looking for is response and an acknowledgement, and you can make it better that way. Um, so that's kind of how I handle it. I, I kind of divvy it up. But, but social media, I, I try and, and tend to not engage uh, with anything and just ignore it. I'm, I can take some things here. Kind of an expert at this one. Um, the gaming community, as you guys know, has at times been considered a little bit uh, toxic, maybe. Um, very passionate, though, in, in another way, right? So you have a vast spectrum of passion and feedback and excellent stuff that we can implement into our game. Uh, because I work across the social channels, we get it. We get feedback about the game, so we have to do certain things with that. We get feedback about the stuff that we send out and how we communicate, and then of course we get feedback on how we're doing. Z Farls looks like a potato. Z Farls looks like a trash bag. All things in the chat that my wife's like, "What does that mean?" I'm like, "I don't know. You know, they're they're not into to what we do." But um, the community, there is a so there's 98 percent of it is positive, and I know that the, the trolls make up a vocal minority at times, and it feels like everything's coming at you, and it's really really scary to be on the other end of some of those channels where. If say you actually did make a mistake and then you have to go out and, and correct it, you might feel like, man, I brought this this storm on me and I don't want to look at my phone or I don't want to, you know, like <laughs> accept that this is happening and, and it's really, really scary. Um, but it's okay at the end of the day. What we've learned over time is the more consistent dialogue you have with your players and the more context you can give them as to the decisions being made and um, and in, in the more you can communicate with them and have them un, like get an understanding of what you're working against and how you're, you're speaking with them, you can create a healthy community and people will give you the benefit of the doubt across the board. So um, the other thing you can do is you can also take a break from social media if you feel like it's something that you can't really handle or um, aren't, you're not getting positive feedback from the community. So it's not all about positive feedback. Like we said, there are valid criticisms and concerns and, and you can take that and su absolutely make your show better um, or make your content better or make your performance better. And that's great stuff as well. But in general, if you're just not feeling like it's helping you, like don't be afraid to step away and look back. And one thing I take for granted, I guess, is like people will come up, not many, but they'll say like, hey, I love your show. I love it. And I go, oh, thanks, that's great. And I, and I mean it, but I don't internalize it in a way of like, if I saw Tom Brady, I'd be like, I love, I love what you do, you're great. And you know, that is so many experiences for you and you really, really mean it and they just say thank you. But when someone's like, hey, this thing sucks, you're like, you take that, the negative comment so much more and then you think about it. Whereas the 10 people that told you, hey, great job, you're like, thank you, thank you. But you don't think of like what it took for them to tell you that thing, so I would say, don't weigh it, don't always weigh the negative more than the positive, but um, reach out to me if you have any stuff about this. I think it's super important. I think it's one of the most, as the future goes on and, and how the world is continuing to grow and how people are communicating online, like this is something that you do not want to let take, take you off track because you're not feeling um, the proper way. You can't get nervous about showing up and that's part of that committing to the process and getting there every day. If people are giving you negative feedback and you're like, I don't think I can go back out there today. Um, that's something you don't want. So seriously, contact me there and we can work through anything that, that might go like that. Great, this great stuff uh, that Zach and Jamie have given you and I'm just gonna try and dovetail with them a little bit. When you have people give you what you would consider a critique or negative feedback, however you wanna categorize it, one thing you have to do is something that I learned as, a, as an athlete, and I'll guarantee you Gordy heard it a number of times, and I'll clean it up because our coaches, they, our, their language might have been a little saltier, but it's encapsulated in this. When they tell you that you're an idiot, don't listen to them. When they tell you why you're an idiot, evaluate that. 
and see if there's something there. And I think Jamie and Zach were talking about that, that sometimes there is some critiques that come through. There are some critiques that come through that have some validity that you need to examine and check. We all do, okay? Um, there's times I've gotten things where I went, oh, man, boy, they are spot on on that one. Boy, they, they nailed that. I really, that's something I really need to work on and correct. So it's just one of those things because if it's just a, a barrage of how stupid you are and how this is dumb and all that, you don't need to wade through all that. But they're pretty specific. This is what you didn't do or this is what didn't happen. Then evaluate and see if there's some, some validity there. The other thing is, Jamie talked about appearance. And I would say 98% of the time, appearance, unfortunately, is directed most strongly and vehemently towards women. Men kind of get away with stuff. And it's not right. And I'm not saying just kind of let it go. But I will guarantee you if Jamie and I compared and Zach <laughs> compared our timelines, our appearance co comments are minimal compared to Jamie's. And that's what you get. You probably all heard the story about the, I guess it was a newscaster somewhere in the world who wore the exact same outfit, a male, for one year, and not a single word was ever said anywhere. No one even noticed <laughs> the exact same outfit, tie, shirt, everything, for a year, nothing. Let Jamie go on air. Guaranteed, I can look at her timeline. I hate your shirt, I hate your hair, I hate your this, I hate your that. That's what women have to go through in a bigger way than men do. So just, just one of those things to keep in mind. The evolution of social media for me has been, Zach talked about it a little bit. I just used to recoil, like, oh my God. Oh my God, and just go into a dark room. I'm a Scorpio. And if you read Scorpio's horoscopes, we do not like to be criticized. <laughs> so having to work through that and deal with that and try and work on it. So when I call a game now, I evolved to this a few years ago, probably about five or six years ago, where after I call a game, I don't check social media. Like if I call a game on Sunday, I don't even check social media until what, Tuesday, Wednesday, usually Wednesday, because I got to let stuff clear through. Because as a general rule, when I'm calling a game, most of the stuff is coming at me in real time if I had my phone on. Like if you went back through the timeline, if you're calling a game depending on who they're rooting for, <laughs> good or bad, that's when you're getting it. And I remember vividly, I had one a number of years ago, I was doing Baylor, Texas A&M. Baylor is leading late. Robert Griffin III is playing quarterback. A&M gets the ball one last drive, somewhere around a 12, 13 play drive. They run it 11 or 12 times and just absolutely stick it in their ear and jam it in the end zone, touchdown, ball game, the whole deal. Now, this is when I used to check after a game because when you're young, you're like, let's see who thought I was great today. <laughs> and whammo. And in real time, on every play, one person was like, you're the worst broadcaster I've ever heard. You are so stupid. You are so biased for Texas A&M. You are this, you are that. And then A&M jams it in, and at the end it's like, huh. I'll never forget it. The person goes, I'm so sorry. I just love Baylor so much. You're a heck of a broadcaster. Great game. So, you, so a lot of it is just the emotion of what's going on. So you have to be able to filter through that. And last but not least, yes, it does affect us. For those who tell you it doesn't, I don't really believe them, okay? How many people know Michelle Tafoya? How many people know that name? Okay, one of the top broadcasters in our business, Sunday Night Football, Michelle can do anything. She is phenomenal. If you follow her timeline and everything on, 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 on Twitter, I know at one point she was very political, okay? So you had to decide whether you, you were this side, that side. I know Michelle, I take the politics out. She's incredible, incredible what she does, wonderful person, the whole deal. I think it was yesterday on her timeline, I don't know if you guys saw this, she was like, I can't take it today. The trolls are getting to me. Is anyone positive in this world? I gotta go out and find some joy today. And I tweeted back to her, I hope you do find that joy. There are a lot of great people out here, I think Zach said it best, like 98% is usually positive, but he also, he and Jamie both mentioned that that negative one can stick with you. 
So you just got to learn to work through that as best you can. You're not going, everyone's not going to love you, no matter what you do. A lot of people are going to hate you right in the beginning. And if my dad as a coach used to tell me all the time, he said, I got 15 guys on my basketball team. Five are going to like me almost no matter what I do. Five are going to hate me almost no matter what I do. It's that middle five I'm working on. See if I can get them to gather onto the team. Now, it's a general statement, but that's kind of the way the world works. Some people aren't going to like you no matter what you do. You just have to learn to work through it. Anybody Twitch uh, gamers? I mean, that's one that I, that's a platform I utilize a lot. And the chat is there in real time. So you can like call to the chat, like, hey, chat, what do you think? I'm, like, give me a one if you like that. Give me a two if you thought it was terrible. And it's like, you can, I, I read as I broadcast. So it's like, oh, Gemini didn't like it. Oh, Ricky didn't like it. And so you can, that can almost change what you're doing in the moment. So there's times where you definitely want to get feedback from the chat and you can help. And I think what, what Charles mentioned too is like the feedback that hurts the most is the stuff that's real. And then that's the stuff you know you kind of got to go and address. Like the mic was too close or this happened or that happened. Um, so you look for those general overall themes that pop up. Um, but don't let the feedback in real time distract you from, from what you're doing and, and look at it later as an aggregate and then figure out how you can get better from it. But um, like I said, it's, it's a new world. It, it really is something different than ever before. Like people call the office, like, hey, tell those guys this or that. And it's like, yeah, that's, this is it. So um, we just want to make sure everything's super healthy and you have great tools to deal with everything and you have the best strategies going forward. So like I said, reach out. And it's not all toxic either. I mean, you know, the worst ones are the ones we remember. But I, I just remember, um, you know, when I started my job as the radio play-by-play -play voice of the Apollos this year, uh, which was one of the football teams from the Alliance, um, I was the only female broadcaster, and there weren't, there's not a lot of females doing play-by-play -play of football, and I hadn't done play-by-play -play in in 20 years, um, but they tabbed me as the voice because I was local and stuff like that, and I was different. My first game, I was not pleased with. I was not pleased with it, but I got through it. I was like, all right, uh, first quarter comes, let's start it and hold on tight and, and let's get through this. At the end of the game, I was very critical of myself, and I'm like, I cannot look at social media because I know how bad social media can be on total pros and, and like Beth Moens, who I think does a tremendous job, a tremendous job, and I thought that uh, I would get negative feedback because I've seen timelines uh, that have been very negative about Beth, even though I think she's phenomenal. Um, I was told myself I wasn't gonna get on there, and I got on there as soon as the game was over, and uh, I had a lot of messages from friends that were very supportive and said that I did a, that I did a good job and there was not one negative comment. So that was really actually helpful. You know, and social media can be really helpful and, and bring you up too. So that was my experience for that, and I'm thankful for that. And back in my day, we didn't have social media, so, so I was good. <laughs> but we did have the phone calls uh, you know, here at Channel 6. Again, the tie, the suit, the hair. Uh, little Hershiser family secret, whenever Big Brother does a national televised game, Little Brother and I are sitting there watching him, and we are sending him texts in between innings, because uh, I said, dude, what are you talking about? Did you ever play the game? Your tie doesn't work for you, your suit, your hair, what is going on? So it's a, it's a family trait as well. So what they're trying to say is you're going to put yourself into a position of you know, being vulnerable because the people are looking at you. They're listening to every single word. It's a one and done kind of situation. They're resting on every single word of what you say. So your credibility is challenged once you open up your mouth. So know what you're doing. And, and I want to slide into the word of performance because I know I press it on my guys. Performance, 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 performance. Is it so much the knowledge and, and the content you're trying to get across or are you more worried about your performance? Charles. That's a great question. Gordy, I like the way you phrased that too, right? Is it the knowledge? Is it, is it trying to impart things to people, you know, about the game or about the, the, the story that you're doing or, or what you're covering? Or are you there to shine, right? Or is your performance paramount? Yeah. Yeah. It is a full combo. It's an absolute combo plate. There's no getting around it. I'd say that you're going to, if I were to err towards anything, if I had to lean hard on anything, it'd be on the content, it'd be on the, on the actual bringing the story alive, it would be on 
calling the game or doing the game or, or covering the story. All of that is where I would lean. But what you're going to hear about is if the performance is quote unquote lacking, the things Gordy just talked about, if your ties askew, if your hair is off here, if it's, that's what they're going to lean on to hit you with. But err on the side of doing a good job for your, for your story, for, for, for what you're working on, and make sure the rest of it, you do the best you can. Because as I've said before, you can be perfectly quaffed, your makeup can be absolutely in spot, everything is fright, and someone will see that little fleck of dust right on Davis's <laughs> right shoulder. How could you miss that, Davis? What is wrong with you? Is that going to ruin your day? I certainly hope not. But that's a great question. I think it is a combo plate but by how we present it and how we bring it to people. But to me, if I'm going to make one thing paramount, it's going to be what my subject is before anything else. Yeah, I agree. I agree with Charles. I mean, if you if you are confident in your preparation and confident in material, that allows your performance to be that much better because you don't have to worry about not knowing anything because you know it. So that you, you know that's not swimming in your head, and then you worry about your performance, and your performance is only going to build and get better with repetition, just like an athlete. You know, if if you're not happy with your first couple of tries, keep working at it but it's gonna get better with reps. It always does. I always feel like I get better with reps too. Um, but yeah, I think your preparation puts you in good position um, to have a, a good performance. Also look back on your old performances and evaluate and self critique, um, cause that helps <laughs> a lot. I know it's hard. Oh, it's hard. Yeah. Like I yeah, hate that's, doing that's it. That's the worst. That's no, I hate doing it. I hate seeing myself mm. on camera. I do, but anyway, but you have to go back and do it. And then, uh, and then you'll pick out, you know, the outfits that look good on you. Um, there are dresses that I trash immediately after I see them. I'm like, oh, that didn't work. But anyway, but really content preparation is the key, I think. I, yeah. I, trash, I trash the last dress I tried. <laughs> really? The last one, the last dress I had, I said that so one had to go fitting? too. It, was it, that was not good. Was that low neckline? Nothing should ever be oh, form fitting okay, on okay, me. All right. okay. Well, make sure you Never. shave your legs. It should be more of a tent. <laughs> I think it, it goes back into the, the preparation so that when you go into the performance, you know that you've done everything possible and you can just worry about like just going out there and doing what you do. So cloudy mind, slow feet. If you're thinking about what you have to say or the stories you have to tell or if you're nervous that you, know, you don't have everything you would normally have for a regular broadcast, then you could struggle. That could get on your mind. So once you go into the zone, as long as you've done the work up front, you know you're going to go and, and getting the reps doing them on your own, practicing, training, leaving nothing to chance, uh, getting, making sure you're set is, is key. Getting that feedback loop, doing as much as you can, getting the reps, and then building, building from there. Go back and listen to it. Um, difficult to do. I cannot stand my own voice. Have to go back, see how things played off, see how the viewer would have seen the story you told or the pause that you made or like you have to go back, look at that, and say, okay, next time I'm going to try this, or I'd rather have, I wish I would have done it this way, or ooh, I really like, and what's great, Twitch and the chat is, oh, they really like this thing. So not while I was watching it, but when I went back and looked at it, they really appreciated this context I gave to this thing. So getting that type of feedback is great in real time, because then you can go back and say, do more of this, do a little less of that. So that helps. No. I'm sorry, go ahead, Jamie. Uh, uh, another thing, uh, you know, if you love doing what you do, don't be afraid to show it because it, it can be contagious. Your audience knows it. I remember watching Rishi uh, in Tampa, and here was this guy with great energy, a smile on his face, and I knew he loved his job. Accurate. <laughs> Speaking of jobs, oh, Charles, you had one. Yeah, yeah, real quick, I want to bring it back to how Gordy framed this thing, and for everyone up here, as you prepare and you prepare yourself to do the utmost on that job, I think we've all said pretty much the same thing about preparation and knowing your subject matter and all that stuff. Most of the time, you're not by yourself, okay? You have producers, directors, you have camera, people working, right? You have, you have you know, mm -hmm. all this, you, you have a team. Make sure you know your team re really well too. Know them as people know them away from, from where you're working, 
know what, what, the, what, what makes them happy in life, know about their family if they have it, know about their friends. I'm not saying you got to do the, the total deep dive where you know every aspect, but un have an understanding that we're not going to just talk about just simply this. Okay, how's it going today? What's happening? What's going and mean it when you're doing it. And the reason I bring that up is when you do the utmost in preparation, every person you work with doesn't do the same. So you have to understand who might not be up to that task and make sure that you have that part covered too. Because at the end of the day, if you're the person out there, how many times have we heard this one, right? If you're the person out there, that's the only person that people are evaluating. They don't know Absolutely. that Bobby yep. didn't, get that, didn't get his job done that day, and you're trying to compensate for it. So you can find a way to compensate for Bobby so that you're not left hanging. Does that make sense in what I'm saying? We understand, we understand more how TV works and how cameras work and how shows operate and how producers <clears throat> produce and the content of the show. But not everybody has a clue at all. They think that Charles decided to use broadcast view during the touchdown which missed the corner of the left side they're mad at him for not changing the camera so obviously that's not valid feedback but that is ultimately what happens so no matter what you have to hold yourself to a super high standard and make sure that you are delivering up to that standard not everybody may go to that level of preparation that you do they might may not make a hundred flashcards for their specific thing but if you can be sure when you're on a team and when you're on a broadcast team if you're up to that standard and, and you consistently show that level of excellence, people will rise to that level. People will do what they can get away with. They won't always do what they know they should do. And so if, at least if they see you do those things and you hold them to that accountability level, they'll help you deliver an ultimate show that you can be proud of and that they can then be proud of. And it goes back to what Charles said about once you get off the set, thank everybody. Let them know that all the work they did made what – you shine look possible, right? It's a team. It's a team game, and not a lot of people understand that, right? And if you're within the Dan Patrick School of Sportscasting, uh, I, I promise you this: we did not provide any answers to Jamie or Zach or Charles. Um, and if you really listen to what they're talking about, they're conveying the same messages that we are within the school. Your voice. You have to develop your voice. You have to do your preparation. You have to have your relationships. You have to be sincere. You have to be forward. You have to be pushed in and all in. You decided to come here, so do it. These three individuals, they did not achieve where they're at. No one just said, hey, we're going to give you that position. Okay? They worked exceptionally hard because it's a competitive world out there. So you have to set your sights on your goals and focus and do not take no for an answer. These three individuals right here are a testament to that drive right there. Speaking of goals, I have a question for the audience. How many of you are worried about finding your first job? All right. A lot of hands. You're on <laughs> so let's get, in, let's get into jobs right now. So why don't we start with Jamie, because you've had the most traditional path of the three here. Uh, how do you get the first job, which I think a in a lot of ways is the toughest? Okay, so my deal was this. I graduated from school in 1998. It was a long time ago. Um, my professors there told me and told the rest of us in our, our class that you will not get your first broadcasting job in the first six months after graduation. We all go into panic mode or we think, well, that's not going to happen to us. Well. I had a freelance gig doing some play-by-play -play that paid me $125 a game out of school. Yes. And I would get, well, since it was summer, there were no games to do because there were collegiate <laughs> games. Get some microwave so, so my yeah, very first, right? yeah, my very first professional job out of college was at J.C. Penney's. And uh, yeah, I was a little depressed, <laughs> um, but I would send out my resume, you know, send out my tape. We had tape back then. But the way I got my first job, this was in Watertown, New York. It's market 175. It's up near the Canadian border. Uh, Lovely, any time of yes. it, <laughs> With three foot snow banks. <laughs> nice. But basically, <laughs> you never know how you're going to get the first job. This is how I got my first job. God's honest truth. My boyfriend at the time, he and I had been dating at Syracuse. He got a job right away 
out of school as a news reporter at this station in Watertown. Since I didn't have a full-time job, Watertown was an hour from Syracuse. I just moved up there and started you know, toiling my craft at JCPenney. And because I was up there, a news position opened up. And now I wanted to do sports, no question about it, but a news position opened up about five months after I was th uh, there. Because I was in the market, because I had a background, and because my boyfriend recommended me, I got that news reporter position. It was hard. It was the hardest job I've ever had, being a news reporter. It wasn't something I was passionate about, but I needed to get my foot in the door some way, and I did. And then 10 months later, a sports job opened up at that very station, and, I, and they slid me over there. So that's how I got my first job. It was hard, but you just keep at it. And it, it's going to be different for everybody. It's going to be different for everybody. I mean, there were people that I knew that did get jobs right out of school. There were people that I knew that had jobs while they were in school, like Jeff Glor. Um, I, I don't know if you guys know who Jeff Glor was. He was just the anchor of the CBS Evening News. Um, he started working in television as a junior in college um, and was hooked up with this sweet anchoring job in Syracuse once he was graduating, making $60,000 a year, which was a lot of money back then. And that's how he got on his path. So it's different for everybody. The one thing that Jeff did, unbelievably smart guy, unbelievably hardworking, super dedicated, but he got his foot in the door because he went and knocked on doors when he was in school. And, and that's kind of what you have to do. And, and we've had interns um, who have performed so well at our station, we've given them jobs here in Orlando. So you just have to take advantage of your opportunities and maybe take a job at JCPenney. <laughs> they weren't hiring at Filene's basement that day, so she went to JCPenney instead. Sorry, old school joke. Um, for me, I've had a lot of jobs. Uh, right out of college, I worked at an engineering firm in Boston, and I did not know a single thing about engineering, so I was probably not a great employee. Uh, it was an eight to five, like very traditional. Like if I worked till 5.03, I was like, wow, <laughs> really putting the hours today. Uh, and it was traditional, and the reason I'm wearing shorts today is because that job I had to wear pants and a polo every single day, and I said, hey, I hate wearing pants. If I ever get a job where they let me wear shorts, that's a life goal, and I will take advantage of that. So I wear shorts pretty much every day. So it's the little things that really matter. Um, from there, as I was working the eight to five, I'm like, this is not it. It's, it's good, it's paying the bills, but this isn't it. So what I did was I actually started working at a sportscaster studio for kids that was local to the area. And same thing, knocking on doors, I walked into a basement and was like, hey, I have this piece of paper from this college that's a comms degree, can I work here? And they said, yeah. So uh, worked there for free for about a year, developing a, a one hour show every weeknight with kids, teaching them how to become sportscasters. And that allowed me to use the space to make my show better. So I moved it out of the parents' basement into this other guy's basement and uh, started making the show there. Better technology, a little better lighting, a little better equipment. Met people, met uh, networking. That's when EA then saw the show after two to three years into it and then offered us the guide. So there was a lot of extra work that went into it. And what I'll say is like everything that I've done so far and all the jobs I've had, they, they feel like they've ended not in the ultimate thing that I'm going to like do and, and become. Like I would consider everything I've done up to this point almost to be a failure. Um, I would consider the weekly show to be a failure. I would consider um, me becoming a successful individual on my own. Like I was running my own business, doing the books and doing that. I ended up uh, moving to Orlando to work at EA by taking chances, taking opportunities that I believe to be possibilities. I moved to Florida six months uh, before I actually started to work at EA. No job, there was, yeah, you can probably work here. We've worked with you, we, we, we know you're good, but I didn't move for an actual job. Um, I moved for a contractor position, not a full-time position. Um, when I worked at EA, I was the Madden guy, I had written all these books. I spent a year working on Titanfall a different game, flying to LA every week, not working on Madden in the studio that I was sitting in. But I said, hey, what does the team need? What can I do? How can I help? How can I get in the door? And it took me three years, 
from leaving Boston getting to and living in Orlando to actually get the job that I felt like I deserved at EA. But it took three years of actual work to prove that I could do the thing I wanted to do. And um, as I do this daily show now, you know, people are always going to tell you no. Um, they're always going to, not everybody is all the time, but li like life is going to tell you no. There's, there's a lot of other candidates. There's a lot of other opportunities for, for other folks. You have to keep kicking down the doors. You have to keep pushing it on. If you want to do something, you have to find a way to keep it going. And every single thing that's ended for me, YouTube, Twitch, the books, the, the, the weekly show, the other jobs I've had, all those things have like morphed into what I'm doing now. So I would consider those failures, but they've all taught me something that I've taken and moved on to, to this current thing that I'm doing now. I'm sure that will end sometime and we'll We'll figure out whatever the next thing's going to be, but I'm going to keep going because I like to do this thing. It's a great outlet. It's a good passion. Um, and even though I get to host the daily shows, I still have to do the work uh, of a regular position. So tons of opportunity, learn all the skills, and just keep on going from there. You're getting a pretty good message, aren't you? Yeah. You hearing that from, from, from them? Very quickly, belief in self, belief in your talents. That will allow you to continue to knock on doors. That will allow you to bounce back from disappointments. And I hope I'm not giving anyone the wrong impression because I understand this business in this room, I'm pretty sure encapsulates people who are going to do so many different things in our world. We're gonna have on air people, we're gonna have behind the scenes people, you're gonna have the producers, the directors, the editors, you name it is in this room. So how are you going to fight through all the time to get to where you want? And that's going to be the big one. You know, the, and, and there's going to be times where you're going to drive yourself crazy when, you, you know, your parents and your friends are going to say, well, you got knocked down 18 times. You got to get up a 19th, and you're going to want to punch them right in their face. And you might. I just hope it's not me. But there is a truth to that adage about doing that. You know, Zach moved, Zach moved from parents' basement to a friend's basement. Where, where, where was the food better? Was the food better at home or? Mom, mom did some good cooking. Mom, I can't mom complain. Job, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I mean, my parents, you know, it was no, good. No, it they're was looking out. They're looking out for their baby yeah. boy, you know. But all I'm saying with all of that is, you've got to find that way to have that belief in what you do and that your talents are good enough. Because I don't think there's any. Look, you heard it. J.C. Penney's to get started. All right, to get to. So, oh, now I got to be a news reporter. I don't have the passion for it, but I got to create a passion for that so that maybe I'll have a chance to get to where I want to go. He keeps talking about failure. This was a failure, this was a failure, this was a failure. They weren't absolutely failures, but for him, they were, they were the path and the journey to get to where he wants to go. And I will guarantee that both of my colleagues sitting right here still feel like they're somewhere else, whether, whether it's another place in the country or another spot or whatever, there's always that. What'd you say before, don't plateau? Right. Don't plateau. That's what you're looking for. That's what you're trying to do. I'm the most non-traditional, and I'll put it in a nutshell for you. I thought I wanted to do this in college. I got a job right out of college as an intern at the Southeastern Conference office. I went from there to be a football coach at the University of the Pacific at the age of 25. I think I was 24. Yes, 24. And I went out there to coach, and I coached with a guy by the name of Hugh Jackson, who you may have heard of, who had a couple shots in the NFL. I coached with a guy, and he was my roommate named John Gruden. You may have heard of him. And I'm the black sheep out of that group because I didn't continue in coaching. And went on from there to the United States Olympic Committee, went from there to Disney's Wide World of Sports, and then I got a call out of the blue to try and do a couple of football games here locally by Sunshine Network. A woman by the name of Kathy Whedon, who I will be forever in her debt, called me from Sunshine. The first call I got, the first game I ever did, though, was Fox Sports South. A man by the name of Steve Craddock, who still works for Fox Sports, works in the NASCAR package, called and offered me two games. <laughs> and I never forget saying to him, Steve, I've never done this before. What if I'm really bad in the first game? He goes, well, you'll be really bad in the second one because I got no one else. <laughs> And I did my first game, and then Kathy called Steve. She saw me and said, hey, who's the new guy? And he said, well, that's funny. You're in Orlando. He lives in Orlando. Ding. She needed a couple of games. Now you don't have to pay for flights and all that. She gave me an opportunity. And it just kind of grew from there. 
But if you think that the path has just been, <laughs> been a lot of <laughs> no, 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 you're not it, no. Hey, you've had this package for three years. We're going to use someone else now. Belief in self, belief in talents. Got to keep battling. Parents' basement, J.C. Penney, uh, getting your first opportunity and just uh, cutting your teeth and making your mistakes. Uh, I remember when I graduated University of Alabama, uh, firing out those tapes, getting denied, denied, denied. I think there was a service back then called Media Line. Mark Shillstone was the guy. Um, became a very good friend. I, I have no idea how many tapes that I sent out, but I was doing a t-shirt business in, Tuscal in Tuscaloosa until finally I, I got my opportunity in St. Joe, Missouri. Whew, the Mecca. <laughs> yeah, yeah. North of, uh, an hour north of Kansas City. I uh, had four states to learn, had Iowa, Nebraska, Kansas, and Missouri to learn. So now you're getting into those multiple states, but I look back and some of my greatest times were in those lower markets. Oh yeah. Because I know all of you, you want to go to the Mecca up in Bristol. You're going to go big desk, you're going to have people pow pow powder your nose and do your hair and stuff like that right when you graduate. Mm. I hope it happens. Yeah. Um, but you're going to have to go somewhere where um, you're going to have to be a, a one-man operation. And I think it's those lessons that uh, not only in the success of television, but those lessons of life of having to really appreciate what I have to do to get where I want to be. Think about, think about the people as well. The, the people Charles mentioned, he remembers them by name. I remember the people who helped me by name. I know Gus keeps giving me opportunities, uh, and I want to deliver on those opportunities. Justin Duell, a guy, gave me that first call at EA. He was the connection. He was the tissue that, that brought us down. And the relationships you have, those are the people you prepare for. Those are the people you don't want to let down. And um, as we talked about interns and, and hiring them, you, as a leader, take an interest in those people who show up and can do consistent things and are willing to go to those crazy places and are willing to hold the camera and talk and edit and do this and that. And once you, as a leader, find those people, you want to give them that opportunity. You want to be that person that Charles mentioned gave him an opportunity. You want to become their conduit in, into, you want to see them succeed and you want to continue to try and help them connect and network. And you don't know, when you're young, you have the ability, you have the opportunity, I'm getting played off. Uh, when you have the opportunity to, uh, it's not the first time, it's not the first time. I'd like to thank, no. Uh, you never know what's going to, to come. So take as many chances as you can. You never know which one's going to be the lottery ticket. Do that and then you'll see where the connections go and don't let the people down who, who take that chance on you. And you're your networking can start right now among all of you guys and girls because what you guys are, you're part of something very special here in this school. There's nothing like this in the country and you guys are among the first classes. So don't lose touch with each other. Make good impressions on each other and be willing to help each other out because I know with my school, um, you know, that's my number one networking source, is the kids that I went to school with, kids who graduated before me, kids who graduated after me. You guys are something really, really special. You're gonna set the foundation, so don't lose touch with each other either. And Charles brought up a great point. It only takes one person to believe in you. Through all the rejection you might face, especially early on, if you get one break, that can be your ticket to success. I think we have time for uh, some questions, um, about 10 minutes for questions, so we'll get in as many as we can. Uh, raise your hand, and Richard Tiemann would like to ask the first one. Richard? What you guys do requires a really delicate balance of confidence and humility. And you guys talked about your first opportunity and that first door that opened, but when it came to the big break opportunity for you guys, or maybe the one that led to your big break opportunity, how did you know you were ready? And did it find you or did you find it? Oh, I, I can go with this. Um, <clears throat> I think one of my big breaks was the Apollos gig. And I didn't know I was ready. You know, it was, it was the one time I really had doubt, like I could really suck at this. I don't know how I'm gonna do. 
but other people believed in me and believed that I could do it. So I said, well, what the heck? I can't let this opportunity go away because I don't have 100% confidence in what I'm gonna do, but I can prepare as hard as I can. And I go in, I do it. The first game I felt was rocky, but I was excited about the second game and then the third game, and then, and then it was is great. Um, so I wasn't sure, and you're not always going to be sure, but don't let that hold you back. Um, and then for like the TV stuff that I do, um, you know, I was always pretty confident, you know, from one stage to the next because I got those reps, I got the experience in the small markets, I made tons of mistakes in Watertown so I wouldn't make the same mistakes in Syracuse, and then I would make those mistakes in Syracuse, I wasn't going to make those mistakes in Albany, and I made the mistakes in Albany, I wasn't going to make them in Orlando, and then you continue to learn. So that's, that's how I felt. Yeah, you're never sure. I don't know that you're ever really sure that you're quote unquote ready, but Jamie just nailed it. You work on your craft, and so you're ready without even knowing that you are. The stage may be bigger, but if you put in the reps and the time, when that opportunity comes, you're probably ready to hit it, but you continue to grow, you continue to learn, and, and continue to take from, from those who are willing to help you. Because that was the one thing I did. I just kept beating on people. One of the things I will tell you and tell everyone in here, Find a mentor, find someone who will tell you the truth. And that's the hardest thing, because most people will tell you, oh, you were great, oh, you were this, you over, you were that. You may not have been. Find someone in the business who will tell you the truth. It'll allow you to get better, and as Jamie said, learn from your mistakes and keep going. And, and I'll leave it with this. In, in what I do, being able to make the mistakes I've made, starting with Fox Sports South, Sunshine Network, and working my way up is invaluable to me. Now, when people ask me all the time, what's the number one thing that you need if, if, let's say you're an analyst or a broadcaster, I always tell them, be the greatest player that ever lived, be the best coach that ever lived, because you're going to start out at a real high level. I think Gordy talked about it. You're going to start out at ESPN. You're going to start out at CBS. Tony Romo has screwed it up for so many people <laughs> because he did it really well out of the gate. Hard to do at real, real well out of the gate. And I think, unfortunately, my Tennessee Vol, Jason Witten, bore the brunt of that. Everyone expected him to be just like Tony and just nail it like Tony. And that is a rare thing. That's why what Tony's doing is just like beyond the curve. Glad to be able to make our mistakes in the minors and work our way up to the majors. I, I do think there's a feeling that you, you can always have where um, – you're always going to feel like a fraud. I feel like a fraud still at times. Like, wow, people are going to realize that I have no clue what I'm doing. And like, <laughs> they're going to come knock on the door and be like, hey, why do you have this office? Why do you have all this camera equipment? What are you doing in here? And every day, like monthly, I feel that. Like, wow, they're going to catch on that I have no idea what's happening. And you have to fight that uh, because that can always like creep in. And, and it's something you're always going to face, you know. But it's, it's through preparation and through everything where, where you can kind of combat that. But that, that was a great question. I had more, lost it. But the feeling of, of, of fraud is, is something that you can internally battle with all the time. So it, it never goes away. It never goes away. Uh, I've been on NFL Network. I've been, you know, I, I've watched, I watched Trey Wingo and Michelle Beadle do an awesome job presenting the Madden Bowl. And I sat there with my buddy Steve and I'm like, I could do that, right? That's, that's another big thing of like the, the haters, like I could do that, I could do that. Now, Charles calls NFL games, I could do that, it's not that hard, I could do that. Mm. And then like two years later, they're like, hey, you guys are gonna cast the games up on the Madden Bowl stage, and we're like, oh, oh. So it was the biggest moment, but it was also like, we've talked a lot of trash, we've said, a lot, we've said some things, and now we've gotta go back it up. And, and then we ended up doing well, and, and that was the break, but when we were sitting up there, we're like, they're gonna realize we're not professionals at some point, but. We, we then were, so I don't know. Yeah, you never know who you're going to meet in this industry. Uh, so when, in, when opportunities are provided for you here at Full Sail through the Dan Patrick School of Sportscasting, take advantage of them. Get involved, because the first impression is your last impression. Okay, you can go along, you can be the greatest person in the world, you really could, but you might have one slip up and then all of a sudden a wrench is thrown into, oh, what's the personality character of this individual? But I want to soften it up real quick as my brother's call me, and I'm not going to take the phone call. Anyway, what's the craziest moments you have ever uh, experienced in te television? Okay. Go ahead, go ahead, Jimmy. Okay, so uh, there have been several, um, but just 
the one that'll always stick out for me is the Stan Van Gundy, Dwight Howard impromptu press conference. I was right there, it was awesome. It was awesome. So, you know, we're holding court the Magic, we're playing the Knicks. It was April 5th, uh, 2012. Dwight had um, recommitted, opted back into his contract with the Orlando Magic. But then there were stories that he wanted to have Stan Van Gundy, the head coach, fired. And Stan is as straight of a shooter as you are going to get, and he is great. So we're at shoot-around prior to the Knicks game, and everybody surrounding Stan Van Gundy for his media availability, he's asked point blank, do you think Dwight wants to have you fired? Yeah, I know he does. And then I see, so I'm in this huddle, but I see Dwight down the hall. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what should I do? Should I go and get Dwight's comment? Because this is, this is unbelievable. And I'm like, oh my God, what's he doing? He's walking towards us. Here comes Dwight. Oh my God. And then he comes in, breaks the huddle, and puts his arm around Stan Van Gundy, and it's just Boom, has no idea that Stan just put it out there. And it was the most awkwardly Oops. awesome thing I've ever seen. And that's why, if you get a chance to cover the NBA, do it, because it's great. <laughs> so that, that's probably the wildest thing. All right, well, we have to wrap things up here. Wish we could get some more questions, but that's all the time that we have. Uh, we're going to have to clear the room, but if you'd like to speak to anyone in our panel, if they have the time to, it's up to them. Uh, I'm sure they'd be happy to uh, get to meet all of you. So thank you guys for joining us. Uh, thank our panel once again.